job. Senator Stoker, it being 2 p.m., we'll move to questions without notice. Senator Green. Oh, sorry, Senator Cormann, my apologies. I seek leave to um, advise the Senate in relation to a ministerial absence and arrange Le representation. Leave granted, Senator Cormann. I advise that Senator B uh, Birmingham will be absent from question time uh, today due to ministerial business overseas. In Senator <laughs> Birmingham's absence, I will represent the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment and the Assistant uh, Trade and Investment Minister. Senator McKenzie will represent the Minister for Education. Senator Canavan will represent the Minister for Energy and Emissions Reduction and the Minister for the Environment. Thank you. Senator Green. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. On nine occasions now, Minister Rustin has assured the Senate that debt recovery has not resumed in Townsville. Yesterday, I tabled in the Senate a notice issued by Centrelink on the 8th of July to a Townsville resident impacted by the unprecedented flooding for a debt of $2,000. Given the minister has misled the Senate on nine occasions, will she now apologise to the Senate and correct the record? Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, and thank you, Senator Green. Um, as I said yesterday, and on numerous times before, the, the debt recovery pause that was put in place in February in Townsville and a number of postcodes in northern Queensland was yeah, paused, suspended. You can use whatever terms you'd like, Senator. However, the pause that was put in place in February remains in place today. Okay. The, the difference, and, and, and I, I, I apologise about the, the technicality of my response coming here, but I'm afraid you're going to have to cop it. On the 2nd of July this year, I, can I just reiterate once again, debt recovery, as it was in place on the uh, in February, has not recommenced. I will recommit that same so you can, That makes it 11 times that I've said it. On the 2nd of July this year, as is normal pr uh, practice, a compliance activity resumed. Okay. Now, on the 22nd of July this year, that issue was brought to my attention and the attention of the minister who is responsible for human services and Centrelink, uh, Minister Robert. At that time, the, an instruction was given to the department that not only should the debt recovery pause remain in place, that no further compliance activity should occur in the Townsville area or the affected postcodes. That has subsequently happened. Now, last night, following the receipt of your heavily redacted letter, um, which was quite difficult to get to the bottom of, um, I asked the department um, to undertake a review to determine whether any other such letters as the one that you provided me with yesterday have been sent out in the area that has been affected by this pause. That result, I will report back to this chamber as a result of that investigation. But I, what I would say, and I will continue to say, order, Senator Green, a supplementary question. Mr. President, it's good to finally be getting some details. So let's try for some more. Yesterday, the minister told the Senate that the pause that was placed on those postcode areas in the Townsville area, post the floods, remains in place. Yesterday, I tabled in the Senate a notice issued by Centrelink on the 8th of July to a Townsville resident with the postcode 4812. Was this one of the postcodes? And if so, why did the pause not apply? Senator Rustin. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Senator. And yes, the postcode that was on the heavily redacted letter was one of the postcodes that was paused. Uh, and, and I will reiterate that the income pause that was put in place in February remains in place. I have advised the chamber that on the 2nd of July, uh, I've been advised that on the 2nd of July a compliance activity resumed. On the 22nd of July, when Minister Robert became aware of the compliance activity, this is not debt recovery per se, but compliance activity, it was, was lifted. When it was lifted, um, the minister immediately sought for that to be put back in place. And what I will now say again to this chamber, what I will now say again to this chamber is that. If there are any people identified by the internal review by the Department of Human Services, or if you have anybody else that you have identified, I will give the undertaking that they will be contacted and advised that there is no 
debt recovery Order, in place. Order, Senator then... Rustin. Senator Green, a final supplementary question. So let's get a really clear answer. When asked why her own department had contradicted her, the minister told the Senate that her department was wrong. Given the minister has now had a week to check with her department, what did her department mean when it told the Townsville Bulletin that compliance activity had resumed? Senator Rustin. Without wanting to split hairs, uh, Senator, I am, try I, I, am, I am advising you debt reply and compliance activity. But what I will reiterate again is, as I said, if anybody is identified through my internal process and the internal process instigated by Minister Robert in the Department of Human Services, if anybody else is identified, we will contact them. If you'd like to provide us with the names and details of the person whose letter you provided, we are happy to contact them to say that we will not be pursuing any debts that have been instigated as a part of the compliance process. I stand by my comments that the debt recovery pause that was in place in February remains in place and has always been in place and will not be lifted until some time in the future. And I give an undertaking to advise this chamber and the people that are affected when that pause is to be lifted. Order. Senator Rennick. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs. Will the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is demonstrating it is on the side of the Australians who chose strengthened national security at the election. The minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Rennick for the question. Uh, Mr President, on this side of the chamber, we are committed to keeping Australians safe from the threat of terrorism. We understand that the fundamental priority of your Commonwealth Government must be the security of the nation and the security of the people. We have actually passed 17 tranches of legislation since 2014 when the terrorism threat level was raised to probable. The government is proud of the work that it has done in this place in the last fortnight in particular to make our nation more secure. And in fact, today we passed further legislation. Mr President, we are facing some of the greatest threats our nation has ever experienced. One of these threats is returning foreign fighters. Since 2012, around 230 Australians have travelled to Syria or Iraq to fight with or support groups involved in the conflict. Agencies assess there are around 80 Australian men and women currently in Syria and Iraq who have fought for or otherwise supported Islamic extremist groups. The advice of our national security agencies is that many of these people are likely to seek to return to Australia in the very near future. The government's temporary exclusion orders legislation ensures that if an Australian of counter-terrorism interest does seek to return to our country, it is with adequate forewarning and in the hands of the authorities. This is critical national security legislation, and I thank senators for their support. I also thank the Senate for the support in passing today the government's ASIO amendment, sunsetting of special powers relating to terrorism, Offences Bill 2019. Order. Senator Rennick, a supplementary question. Minister, why is a strong and consistent approach to national security important? Senator Cash. Again, Senator Rennick, you are part of a government, as you know, that makes no apology for taking strong action to keep Australia and Australians safe. Senator Rennick, you will be aware that there are individuals and groups who are actively seeking to wreak havoc in our community. Since September 12, 2014, when the national terrorism threat level was raised, there have been seven attacks and 16 major counter-terrorism disruption operations in response to potential attack planning in Australia. Around 230 people in Australia are currently being investigated for providing support to terrorist groups involved in the Syria-Iraq conflict, including through funding and facilitation or seeking to travel to join these groups. It is the most important responsibility of a government 
to protect its citizens, and that, Mr. President, is what we are doing. Senator Rennick, a final supplementary question. Minister, how might different approaches put Australians at risk? Senator Cash. Well, Mr. President, what has been on display over the last two sitting weeks is that the Leader of the Opposition cannot get support for critical national security legislation from the extreme left of his own party. What we have seen over the last two weeks is the opposition's approach to national security has become a chaotic mess. Mr President, the number one priority of a government must be the security of its nations. Mr President, under the Morrison government, we will never ever make an excuse for putting the security of our nation and the security of Australians as a number one priority. Senator Keneally. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Earlier this year, the government banned right-wing commentator Milo Yiannopoulos from entering Australia. Mr Yiannopoulos has described young Muslims as rape-fugees and Islam as barbaric and alien. Can the minister explain why the government banned Milo Yiannopoulos from entering Australia? The minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr President. Uh, these were judgments, of course, uh, that were appropriately made, consistent uh, with uh, the provisions in our Migration Act, as I uh, indicated uh, to the Chamber yesterday. I mean, the Australian Government is committed to protecting the community from criminal or other serious harm by non-citizens. All non-citizens who apply for entry into Australia must uh, meet the character test set out uh, in the Migration Act. A non-citizen can fail the character test for a number of reasons, including where they have a substantial criminal record or where they where their conduct poses a risk to the Australian communities. Uh, for visitors who may hold controversial views, as I've said yesterday, any risk uh, they may po pose uh, will be balanced against uh, Australia's well-established uh, commitment to freedom of speech and freedom of beliefs, amongst other relevant considerations. Now, these are judgments that are made on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. Uh, the um, case, uh, while we never comment on individual cases, um, obviously, um, the case uh, that uh, Senator Keneally refers to um, was approached uh, in the appropriate way, consistent with our laws, and as will all cases into the future. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Mr. Rahim Kassam has campaigned against Muslim migration, described Islam as a fascistic and totalitarian ideology, and said that the Quran was fundamentally evil. Yet the government's refusing to ban Mr. Kassam from entering Australia. Can the minister please explain the difference between Mr. Kassam and Mr. Yiannopoulos? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I, as I've indicated yesterday, I fundamentally disagree uh, with uh, some of the views uh, that he has expressed and that you've uh, now related to the Chamber. In fact, I object to those views. But I would also uh, make uh, the point, the general point, to just uh, further uh, what I've indicated in the primary answer. And that is, and I've written this in a letter to the Senate yeah. President earlier today too. The government fundamentally believes in and supports the principles of freedom of thought, speech, expression and association. It is those freedoms which underpin a strong and healthy order. democracy. Senator bad Se order. Senator Cormann, Senator Keneally is on a point of order. My point of order is one of direct relevance. The question was clear. I asked the minister to explain the difference between Mr. Kassam and Mr. Yiannopoulos. Um, I, I think I am listening. I'm trying to listen to the minister's answer. Um, I think he's being, direct rele being directly relevant by virtue of the way he's answering the question and highlighting this particular piece of correspondence. Senator Cormann. Th thank you very much. I mean, obviously, everyone who comes to Australia has to comply with Australian laws. Everyone who comes order. Everyone order. who comes to Australia must comply with Australian laws, and uh, I think I think that uh, Senator Wong is well aware that we do have laws. Uh, that appropriately deal uh, with uh, uh, hate speech uh, and vilification uh, and, and the like, appropriately, appropriately, deal with those, uh, appropriately deal with those matters. I would say again, uh, the government will always stand Order, against— Senator Cormann, time for the answers expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Given Mr Kassam's comments and their similarity to Mr Yiannopoulos's comments, will the Prime Minister now instruct the Minister for Immigration to review Mr Kassam's visa? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, as I've indicated to the Chamber yesterday, it would be entirely inappropriate uh, for us to uh, 
uh, detail individual cases and the consideration of individual cases under the Migration Act uh, in the way uh, that uh, Senator Keneally uh, has invited me to do. If Senator Keneally understood about uh, the Migration Act and how that is appropriately administered, uh, she would not have asked me that question. Senator Di Natale. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs or, or the Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, during the fifth Pacific Islands Development Forum Leaders Summit this week, our Pacific neighbours have joined almost 900 jurisdictions to declare a climate emergency. Minister, do you acknowledge and, and more importantly, understand the incredible worry, trauma and fear? that our Pacific neighbours are experiencing as they directly watch the impacts of the climate crisis affecting their islands and their very survival. The Minister representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr President, and thank you, Senator Di Natale, for that question. Uh, in short, the answer is yes. We are very acutely aware and engaged uh, with our Pacific neighbours on the issue of climate change. So that is the direct answer to your question. Uh, but can I also say, in, in relation to uh, the issue that you re refer to, which relates to the carryover emissions from Kyoto and the discussion around that, I can say that Australia does have a very strong order. record of meeting our Senator, emission targets. Senator Reynolds, Senator Di Natale, on a point of order. Point of order on relevance. I didn't actually ask about carryover credits uh, in my question, although it is my next question, Senator, and uh, it's good to see that you're, you've been briefed appropriately. Uh, and, uh, and may in fact have uh, some form of ESP that you can anticipate. Order. Senator, on the, uh, the point my, of order, uh, my supplementary question. Order, order. I remind, I remind ministers that when they provide an initial answer, any supplementary material provided must also be directly relevant to the question. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much. And as I said, uh, I answered, not only answered your first question, but I anticipated what you were going to ask me in your second question. <laughs> so the answer is yes, we do. Senator Di Natale, a supplementary question. Well, um, part of the resolution at the uh, forum was, I quote, that relevant parties to the Kyoto Protocol refrain from using carryover credits as abatement for emission reduction targets. Now, that's squarely aimed at Australia, as no other country is going to rely on these credits to keep polluting. Minister, for the importance of diplomatic relations, for the, importance of, for the sake of our Pacific neighbours, will you heed their united call for Australia not to use this dodgy accounting Order. trick? Senator Reynolds. Thank you. Um, thank you again, uh, Senator Di Natale. Australia does have a very strong record meeting our emission targets. We have overachieved on our first Kyoto target and are now on track to achieve on our second. The Kyoto Protocol established the concept of carryover to encourage countries to overachieve. The Paris Agreement does not refer to the use of carryover, and we will know closer to 2030 whether the overachievement will order. be needed Senator at all. Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Yeah, Mr. President, you've given instruction about relevancy of points of order. I take it as standing order 187 and question how a prepared speech can be read in answer to a question without notice. Well, um, I understand, to be fair, the ministers, ministers are known to use briefs to answer questions. Um, I, might also, I might also make the observation that Section 187 has been observed far more in the breach than in its observance in my ten years in the chamber. Um, even if people think it should be enforced, it, it hasn't been. Um, but ministers use briefs in answering questions. I'll, I'll call the minister to continue. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And uh, I was directly relevant. It was uh, talking about Kyoto and carryover, and I was absolutely directly relevant to the question. But Australia will use its overachievement against previous targets to the extent that it's necessary for us to do so. This overachievement reflects meaningful action by Australia to meet our successive targets and is underpinned by rigorous emissions monitoring and accountability systems. By rejecting Kyoto carryover targets before the election, Labor proposed to dramatically increase the cost of Order. meeting its Senator targets. Senator Reynolds, time for the answers expired. Senator Di Natale, a final supplementary question. Mr. President, in the lead-up to the UN's Climate Action Summit in September, the Secretary General is going to be asking nations to bring far more ambitious targets in recognition that current targets have us on track for 3.4 degrees of warming, fundamentally altering life on our planet. 
Minister, will you consider taking higher abatement targets to the UN in September? Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President, and again, thank you for that question. Uh, as I have already said, Australia is uh, meeting our targets, and we are, we are doing so, I think, very well. But in relation to the Paris Agreement and also <laughs> a, a, a emission reduction, Australia must and it will continue to take urgent and effective action to address climate change. We will undertake this as part of a coordinated global effort. Our participation in the Paris Agreement is in the national interest, including our strategic interests, as you have raised in the Pacific. Our regional and our international partners know that Australia can be trusted to keep our commitments. Australia is committed to our Paris target, reducing emissions by 26 uh, to 28 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030. Our target is responsible and it is achievable. Our 2030 target will see us reduce the emissions intensity of our economy by fully two-thirds, and our emissions per person will have halved by 2030. Reynolds. A Senator, record to be proud of. Time for the answers expired. Senator Griff. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Minister Cash, representing the Minister for Health. I refer the minister to an ABC online story which ran last month about a loophole in the Therapeutic Goods Advertising Code which allows pharmaceutical companies to falsely advertise the purported benefits of their products, in this case opioids, to general practitioners. TGA guidelines only stipulate that marketing and advertising must not mislead consumers. They are silent on the promotion and marketing of pres prescription drugs to GPs. The story quotes a TGA spokesperson defending self-regulation of the industry by saying, and I'll quote, it allows the TGA to focus on consumer protection. Minister, if the guidelines effectively allow doctors to be given false and misleading information via lax self-regulatory codes, are you concerned that doctors could potentially be prescribing incorrect doses or inappropriate products? The Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Griff for some prior notice of the question. Senator Griff, I've been able to ascertain the following information for you. The government supports the values and principles of honesty, integrity, transparency, accountability and oversight for the relationship between the medicines and medical device industry in its dealings with healthcare professionals. The government is concerned where these principles are not followed. I'm instructed that the TGA is currently seeking further information from Mundi Pharma to ascertain whether these advertisements have breached the terms of registration. Failing to comply with the condition of registration can result, as you know, in cancellation of the product from the Australian Medicines Register. There are also criminal and civil penalties for failing to comply with these conditions. It is expected that all medicine sponsors engage constructively with the self-regulatory framework around promotion of products to medical practitioners. The TGA are also engaging with Medicines Australia, who govern the industry code, to ensure that it remains fit for purpose. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr President. M Minister, engaging is, 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 is a wonderful word, but will the government actually commit to close the loophole and ensure the code is redrafted? at some time, perhaps after consultation, to cover false and misleading marketing to general practitioners. Senator Cash. Thank you. And Senator Griff, I would refer to the answer that I've just given you. Uh, certainly the minister will await uh, the advice from the TGA, but in the event that there was a loophole or there was something that was discovered, uh, the minister obviously would take the appropriate action. Senator Griff, final supplementary question. The latest version of the TGA code that was in fact tabled yesterday not only does it uh, state that it does not apply to advertisements directly um, directed to health professionals, it also for the first time says that it does not apply to advertisements that are part of or otherwise comprise a public health campaign. Minister, why don't truth and advertising rules apply to public health advertisements? Senator Cash. Uh, well, I'd need to take that part of your question on notice, but again, uh, Senator Griff, what I did state in the answer to my first question was the TGA is currently seeking further information from Mundi Pharma to ascertain whether these advertisements have breached the terms of uh, registration. 
but they are also engaging with Medicines Australia, who govern the industry code, to ensure it remains fit for purpose. So that is currently occurring to ascertain. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Defence. Uh, Minister, this weekend you're going to be attending the Australia-United States Ministerial on Defence and Foreign Affairs. Could you update the Senate on the importance of our defence relationship with the United States? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. <coughs> Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and also thank you, Senator Fawcett, and thank you for your support to this such an important alliance that we have. Uh, Mr. President, the Australia-United States alliance is the cornerstone policy of Australia's national security. The alliance is all about assuring our defence and our security interests, and shaping a peaceful and prosperous region in our in our area. Our alliance continues to be a contributor to peace and stability in our region and also globally. This Sunday I will attend the annual Australia-United States Ministerial Meeting, OSMIN, the 34th such meeting, where Foreign Minister Payne and I will host both the US Secretary of State and also the Secretary of Defence. This OSMIN provides a timely opportunity to discuss critically important issues, including our defence capability relationships. Through our alliance, Australia is afforded unparalleled access to the most advanced technology equipment and also intelligence, all central to maintaining the effectiveness of our Australian Defence Force. For example, the Air Force is the only Air Force outside the United States permitted to operate the EA-18G Growler electronic attack aircraft. The Alliance also facilitates closer industry cooperation. This in turn strengthens Australia's sovereign defence industrial base, which is a key objective of this government. For example, Australia is also a key partner in the F-35 Joint, Joint Strike Fighter Cooperative Program. Participation in this program enables us not only to acquire this leading-edge capability, but it also provides the opportunities for Australian companies and Australian workers, like Quickstep, which is developing critical components for the Joint Strike Fighter, to enter lucrative US markets and supply chains. This all means more Australian jobs. These are just some of the great examples of the benefit of our alliance with the Order. United States. Senator Reynolds. Senator Fawcett, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, could you update the Senate on how the defence forces of both Australia and the United States are working together both around the globe and in our region? Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Defence personnel from both Australia and the United States continue to work together side by side around the world, as we have now for over 100 years, to pursue our shared values and also our shared interests. In the Middle East, the ADF are working alongside their eight US counterparts to provide security and stability for the people of Iraq and also Afghanistan. Having recently visited the region, I can confirm that our people are doing work with our partners in the US to make a real difference to the lives of many hundreds of thousands of people in the Middle East. Today, Australia farewells our next deployment of 270 ADF personnel to the Middle East, to Afghanistan. This deployment represents Australia's commitment to stability in the Middle East and our commitment to working with the United States for global peace and security. Senator Fawcett, final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Minister, could you outline any other ways that Australia and the United States are working together to ensure Australia's national security? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, for over 50 years, Australia has worked with the United States to support national security and also global strategic stability through integrated intelligence collaboration at joint facilities right across Australia, facilities such as Pine Gap in the Northern Territory. But facilities also like the Australian Defence Satellite Communication Station in my own home state of Western Australia, which hosts a US military communications system manned by both ADF and US forces. This station, located in Geraldton, is receiving US project funding in recognition of the important role intelligence plays in ensuring the safety of both US and Australian personnel deployed overseas. Australia's defence intelligent relationship is one of the most tangible manifestations of the depth of our alliance with the United States. Thank you. Senator O'Neill. Very much, Mr. President. 
And my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. After SNP leader Nicola Sturgeon suffered a miscarriage, failed UKIP candidate Rahim Kassam tweeted, and I quote, Can someone just like tape Nicola Sturgeon's mouth shut and her legs so she can't reproduce? Yesterday, Senator Cormann labelled the comments as, and I quote, disgraceful and highly objectionable and completely outrageous that, of course, I entirely abhor, and I'm sure anyone in this Senate chamber abhors. Does the minister agree with Senator Cormann? The minister representing the Minister for Women, Senator Rustin. Thank you, Mr President. Yes, I agree with the comments of Senator Cormann. Senator O'Neill, supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Last night, in the adjournment debate, Senator Stoker defended Rahim Kassam, saying that preventing his speech would be, and I quote, Order. stupid, impractical and harmful for a civil society. Okay. Who is right, Senator Stoker or Senator Cormann? Can I ask for, on my right for silence during the question so I can hear it? Senator Rustin. Um, in Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in responding to the senator's question, um, and I continue to support the views of, of Senator Cormann. Um, however, um, the way to defeat bad ideas, bad arguments, absolutely unacceptable views is through debate, order. especially order. with those. That order, Senator Rustin. Senator Cormann on a point of order. No. Senator Wong, can no, I no, please no. hear Senator Cormann on the point of order? Uh, obviously interjections are highly disorderly, and in this case, if the Labor Party wants to show that they're not just trying to be politically opportunistic about this, but that they actually mean order. they should that listen to Senator, Senator Rustin Cormann. in respectful silence as Senator the standing Cormann. orders require. Order. I'll call Senator Wong when there's silence. Senator Wong on the point of order. I understand Senator Cormann is sensitive about this because he understands there is a difference order. between bad ideas and hate speech. I grant some, hate I, speech. Order, this Senator is about Wong. vilification. I granted some leeway. I grant some leeway to the leaders of parties and the opposition and the government that technically any point of order calling someone to account for interjections and asking for order in the chamber is probably the one point of order that's always guaranteed to be in order. Um, I ask senators to remember that. Um, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I was part way through saying, the way to defeat bad ideas, bad arguments, and in this case, absolutely unacceptable views, is through debate, and especially with those that we disagree. Order, Senator. Have you concluded your answer, Senator Rustin? Senator. So a final supplementary question. Senator Rustin has concluded. Senator O'Neill. Rahim. Kassam once disparaged another female leader, the chair of the Conservative Party, Baroness Wasi, saying she only, and I quote, was promoted because she was from the densely Muslim populated area of Dewsbury. <coughs> Senator Stoker is proud, proud to share the stage with Rahim Kassam. Rahim Kassam. What signal does this send to young women? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said to the answer to your previous question, that it is absolutely um, unacceptable the views that have been expressed in the comments that you've made and the comments that have been quoted in this place. However, however, the best way for us to confront these absolutely unacceptable views is to call them out, and the way to call them out is to call them out publicly. It is Order. not by limiting conversations. Order. Only at those Sorry, Senator Rustin, please resume your seat. I can't hear the minister. Well, it also means I can't rule on a point of order, but if I can't hear it, it means there's 74 others that probably can't hear it either. Seven Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And as I said, the completely unacceptable views that have been expressed in the questions of those opposite yesterday and today that have been attributed, the absolutely unacceptable views, the best way to call them out is to call them out publicly. To call them out publicly, and this is not by limiting debate, you need to call them out publicly. Order. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, order. Mr. President. Can I please hear Senator? Can I please Senator Cormann on a point of order? 
Uh, Se Senator Wong continues to be disorderly. It was Senator Wong who campaigned to make Mark Latham Prime Minister, who is also attending Senator, that Senator conference. Foreman. Order. Is this on? Or when I can hear Senator Wong, I will call her. Senator Wong. I was responding to interjections from Senator Stoker. I will always stand against racism, unlike her. Can I? Order. I, I'm going to specifically ask leaders to be particularly strict on their point of orders to lead by example. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister. Minister, given the huge distances in Australia, our aviation industry is vital to keep the families, tourists and businesses moving. Could the minister explain how the Morrison government's amendments to the Civil Aviation Act will help to deliver benefits to aviation investors and users. The Minister representing the Deputy Prime Minister, Senator Canavan. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. I do thank uh, Senator Macdonald for her question. and She herself personally knows well the challenges of those large distances and also uh, the need to have efficient aviation transport to overcome those and support those who live far away from our major centres. And I also welcome a question that goes to the real challenges and issues that face Australians out there in the, in the real world. Uh, now, the, the, the Liberal National Government does recognise that too often uh, changes have been made uh, uh, through the CASA regime that have imposed unnecessary costs with little or no safety benefit, but have come at a great cost to the aviation sector itself. That's why we have progressed changes to uh, the CASA Act through the Civil Aviation Amendment Bill that has passed through this place. What that will in effect do is elevate the consideration of such costs from uh, from, uh, from a guideline or a statement of expectations, minister's statement of expectations at the moment, through to the legislation itself, and we are in doing that with the intention to ensure uh, that uh, that CASA, who make these standards and regulations, are held accountable to the principles that we set. And I am sure that Senator Macdonald, especially in her role as chair of the Rural and Regional Affairs, Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport Committee, will help make sure that there is an accountability there in support of general, uh, general aviation businesses in this sector. I would compromise that none of these changes will compromise safety. It remains the government's absolute commitment to prioritise a safe industry, but also one that is vibrant and resilient, that supports Australians, particularly regional Australians, that require and rely on these services to do their business, to go about their jobs and to just get to and from important appointments, particularly relating to their health. Uh, uh, th this is a very important sector for our country, uh, for the environment that we live in, uh, and we have a strong commitment to make sure that general aviation in Australia continues to thrive and grow and support all regional Australians. Senator Macdonald, a supplementary question. How important is our general aviation sector to regional Australia? Senator Canavan. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. President. And as I was saying, uh, Senator Macdonald knows well how important the sector is. It, uh, as one case in point, uh, earlier this year in the, the, the devastating floods that hit northwest Queensland, uh, in areas I know that Senator Macdonald knows well, uh, uh, the general aviation sector was crucial for that immediate first response uh, to help people in danger, uh, to support graziers getting feed and other materials to their household and to their cattle, uh, and to help move cattle as much as could be possible out of danger's way. The, the sector itself is a massive one for our country. It employs or directly and indirectly over 500,000 Australians rely on the aviation sector for their jobs. There's something in the order of 22,000 aircraft that support uh, those jobs and the communities they operate in. And uh, there are 255 flying schools right across Australia. And we want to make sure that we maintain that support for regional Australia, regional Australian businesses, because if we can't fly, uh, those distances become longer than they already are. Senator Macdonald, a final supplementary question. Minister, what are the challenges facing the aviation industry in regional areas? Senator Canavan. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Mr. President. The challenges that are facing the aviation sector as a whole particularly affect those in rural and regional areas uh, uh, specifically. Uh, there has been a shortage of pilots right around the world, and that is having an impact for all Australians, but it particularly impacts the general aviation sector in regional areas, which rely heavily on getting uh, those pilots and attracting people into these roles. Uh, so that's why the government has announced in this year's budget an increase in the cap for aviation students through the 
vet fee help support program to help train more pilots from $100,000 to $150,000 to ensure that we have more trainee pilots graduate, come through the qualifications and increase the supply of pilots over time. I congratulate the, uh, the airlines that have established flying schools in regional centres, which will help increase the supply of pilots through regional Australia. Uh, centres are going forward in Toowoomba, Tamworth and Mackay to help ease these pressures. This will also make sure that over time we continue to have a strong and vibrant aviation sector for Australia. Senator Watt. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. On 14 July, the minister posted two tweets following a meeting she had with the CEO of a West Australian firm, Sterling Skills Training. In the tweets, the minister endorsed the firm as, and I quote, an integral part of the vocational education scene in Perth for more than 30 years. Can the minister confirm that her own regulator, the Australian Skills Quality Authority, has cancelled Sterling Skills Training's registration for non-compliance on 16 grounds, including failing to ensure marketing information is accurate and factual, and issues with training, assessment, strategies and practices. The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. And my understanding is, Senator Watt, that the matter is currently uh, before the AAT being appealed. Senator Watt, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you for anticipating my next question. Can the minister confirm that Sterling Skills Training, the firm about which she tweeted, is currently appealing the cancellation of its registration in the AAT, and that while the appeal is underway, the Australian Skills Quality Authority has ordered the firm to neither enrol nor train additional students? Why did the minister think it was appropriate to endorse this firm? Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Well, I was unaware at the time when I met with the firm that this was the case. Uh, the only things I discussed with them were actually youth unemployment. Uh, and as I said, the matter is currently under appeal before the AAT. Senator Watt, final supplementary question. Why should Australians have confidence in a cabinet minister whose office leaks police raids on union offices and now promotes a business that her own agency has deregistered. Senator Cash. Well, thank you, Mr. President. And I obviously completely reject the premise of the question, but it has now given me an opportunity uh, to spend the next 55 seconds talking about how, on this side of the chamber, uh, we cleaned up the mess created by the former Labor government when it came to vocational education within Australia. Because, of course, Mr. President, when I think it was actually the former leader of the opposition, Mr. Shorten, no. was the relevant minister. He actually ripped order. the guts. Senator Watt, on a point of order. On, on relevance, as much as we enjoy Senator Cash in full flight, she hasn't answered the question, which is why anyone should have confidence in Senator her. Senator Watt, you ask a, question, ask a question phrased like that, and it is relatively easy for a minister to be directly relevant to it. Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr President. As I was saying, under the former Labor government, they actually ripped the guts out of the employer incentives when it comes to taking on apprentices. That actually resulted, Mr President, in a decline in the number of young people going into apprentices. But they didn't stop their colleagues. That wasn't good enough. They wanted to destroy the sector even further. And so what they did was introduce a system, a total, complete and utter disaster, known as vet fee health. Yet again, we came into office and we cleaned up their mess. So Australians, they can have confidence order, in those Senator of us Cash. on this side of the chamber. Senator, order. Senator Hughes. Ah, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Health. Can the minister outline to the Senate how the Morrison government is demonstrating it's on the side of Australians who choose affordable medicines by updating us, uh, updating us on what medicines will be listed today on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme and the life-changing benefits they provide? Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. And I thank Senator Hughes for the question and I commend her on the work that she has done in relation to autism. Uh, Mr President, on this side of the chamber, we are very proud uh, to be part of a government that understands that the benefits of a strong economy include providing for the essential services that Australians rely on. And one of these essential services is the pharmaceutical benefits scheme. Uh, we are investing $40 billion 
through to 2022 in the listing of life-saving and life-changing medicines. There can be no greater example uh, of the benefits of running a strong economy than our ability to do this. Uh, Mr President, you would be aware that the government is averaging around 31 new or amended listings per month. This equates now to approximately one additional listing or amended listing uh, per day. But I'm also pleased to report to the Senate and to Senator Hughes that today we have listed colleagues further, further medicines that treat cancer, cystic fibrosis and arthritic conditions. We have listed Avastin for retract, uh, refractory glioblastoma, which is an aggressive brain cancer. Over 900 patients will benefit with the saving of around $31,000 per year. We have also listed Spry Cell. This will save numerous patients over $51,000 per year, and this is for treating Philadelphia positive acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And Somatuline is also being listed for endocrine tumours. Mr. President, this shows that this government is on the side of the Australian people. We get a strong economy, we've got a strong economy, and we're able to realise the benefits Order. of a strong Senator economy. Cash. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Is the minister aware of any of examples of who might benefit from these listings? Senator Cash. Again, uh, Mr. President, the listings on the PBS coming into effect today will change the lives of thousands of Australians. We are only able to do this because of our strong economic management. Today we have extended the listing of Calwai Deco for the treatment of cystic fibrosis in children aged 12 to 24 months. In Australia, one in 2,500 babies is born with cystic fibrosis each year. That's one every four days. And sadly, there is no cure. Calwai Deco will help patients, these young children, to breathe more freely and manage their illness. Mr. President, without our strong economic management, without us being able to list this PBS subsidy medication, patients may pay up to $300,000 a year for Order. this medication. Senator, Cash. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Is the minister aware of any alternative approaches to managing the pharmaceutical benefits scheme? Senator Cash. Thank you, Mr. President. Well, as a government, we have a strong track record of investing in our health system, including increased funding for hospitals, increased rates of bulk billing, and investing, as I've outlined today, in valuable medicines on the PBS. And yes, Mr. President, that's in stark contrast. That is in stark contrast to the last Labor government. Because the last Labor government, they stopped listing life-changing medicines on the PBS right. because they ran out of money. They right. ran out of money and they had to stop right. listing life-saving drugs on the PBS. And in fact, the last Labor government published in their 2011 budget the following. The listing of some medicines would be deferred until fiscal circumstances permit. That is what happens, Mr. President, when you don't appreciate the benefits of a strong economy and the dividends that it can provide Order. to Australians. Senator, Cash. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. The Treasurer has said, in relation to his responsibilities as Environment Minister and to the meeting between Minister Taylor and members of the Environment Part Department, and I quote, a meeting was sought by Angus to understand the technical aspects of the listing process. A briefing was given and no changes have been made to the listing. Was the Treasurer aware of the member for Hume's personal financial interest in the grasslands matter prior to agreeing to the briefing? The Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr President. Obviously, I can't uh, give an answer in relation uh, to the state of mind of another individual. 
Uh, but uh, what we do know is that uh, Mr. Tyler, at all times, appropriately disclosed his private interests consistent with the rules of, as they apply in the House of Representatives. Order. And consistent Senator with Gorman, um, Senator McAllister on a point of order? Yes, I, I, I go to relevance. Um, I have asked specifically whether or not the Treasurer was aware of this. It is a question of fact. And it is a question of fact, and the Minister can't dismiss or ignore the direct question about the, the, the knowledge of the Treasurer at that no, time. Uh, he, Senator McAllister, I, I think, to be fair, the Minister did directly answer that part of the question in his first couple of sentences, um, and he is entitled to be directly relevant to that or a remainder of the question. Senator McAllister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr President. Well, I mean, I, I, honestly, I mean, this is just a continuation of this uh, attempted Labor smear. Uh, I mean, this is against a hard-working hard -working local member and a hard-working minister. Uh, the truth is that uh, Minister Taylor has declared all of his interests consistent with the requirements in the House of Representatives and consistent with the way interests are declared by those opposite. Uh, he also stood up uh, for his constituents in pursuing a policy issue that had been raised with him by farmers across his electorate, indeed, as documented by the National Farmers Federation in a widely publicised piece of correspondence. Uh, it has been very clear, and nobody, no amount of smearing attempted by the Labor Party has been able to show uh, that uh, Mr. Tyler in any way raised matters that he shouldn't have raised. Mr. Tyler has always made sure, has always, has always made clear that he did not raise compliance matters. He's always made clear that he did not raise compliance matters, as he shouldn't have. Uh, and uh, the Labor Party at no point has been able to show that the minister was wrong in those statements. Senator McAllister, a supplementary question. Freedom of information documents reveal that in April 2017, Minister Frydenberg's office requested advice from the Environment Department on whether the grasslands listing could be varied against advice, without publication and without being open to legal challenge. Why was this advice sought? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. That is uh, not a matter in the Treasury portfolio, but uh, it is a matter in the Environment portfolio, and I will seek appropriate advice uh, and provide uh, the appropriate response on notice. Senator McAllister, a final supplementary question. In relation to Minister Frydenberg's request for advice in April 2017 whether the grasslands listing could be varied against advice without publication and without being open to legal challenge, at whose request did the Minister's office seek that advice? Can the minister guarantee the request was not the result of representations by Minister Taylor? On, on this, Senator, I, Senator Cormann. Again, I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Senator McAllister. Uh, no, no, I'm just answering. Senator McAllister clearly doesn't know how to address the question to the responsible minister. Uh, but in order, in, the, uh, in an abundance of help, order, Senator. Um, Senator Wong, I actually was in the discussion with the clerk then, so I did not hear what Senator Cormann said. Well, Senator Wong. I, well, Mr. President, these relate to statements ta um, made. These all, the primary question and what, what, they, what the supplementaries are grounded on is a statement made by Mr. Frydenberg. So, therefore, it is entirely in order to address right. the question to it, the minister representing the minister, for, for um, Minister Frydenberg. I'm if I'm incorrect, I will come back to the chamber next time we sit. But a minister can be quizzed on a statement made, even if it's outside their portfolio. It is therefore, in my view, in order, even though it is a minister representing, to be asked a question about what the minister they're representing has said, even if it is outside their portfolio, with the necessary limitation that, obviously, as Senator Cormann said, they are limited in what they can say about someone, someone else's thoughts. Senator Cormann. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr President. And let me just say whether it was Senator Watt or Senator McAllister who asked the question of the wrong minister, I would have made the same point. So I object uh, to that interjection of mansplaining before. Order. Senator, I I'm not sure if there's a point of order, Senator Wong. I mean, there's a point of debate on what Senator Cormann has said. What time are you Senator Wong. Oh, well, I, I understood the Leader of the Government. I may have misunderstood him, Mr President. I'm prepared to concede that. But I understood him to be disputing your ruling. No, I didn't, inter no. I, I didn't interpret that. Senator Canavan, are you raising a point of order? On this, on this point. Sen sorry. Senator Canavan, uh, on this point of on order? On this point of order, could I just clarify too that that second supplementary only referred to advice sought by the, uh, the Minister for Environment. Now, obviously, Senator Cormann is not representing the Minister for Environment. Now, I, I took your overall ruling there, 
uh, uh, Mr. President, and it went to the question as a whole. But the second supplementary was only in reference to advice sought by the Minister for Environment, which, uh, which Minister Cormann is obviously not representing at the moment. Um, when the assertion was made that it was about a statement, firstly, I will take that at face value. Secondly, this third question, or sorry, the second supplementary, did use words that were contained in the first supplementary. On that basis, I do allow a supplementary to not to, to follow on uh, in that regard, in referring to a statement earlier. Senator Cormann. In any event, uh, given that this is something that is squarely in the responsibility of the in the portfolio responsibility of the Minister for the Environment, I will receive the appropriate advice from the Minister for the Environment and come back to the Chamber. Senator Davey. My question thank you, is to the Minister for Agriculture. Can the Minister update the Senate as to how the Nationals and the Liberals in government are backing Australians who choose to back rural and regional Australia by working with new and emerging technologies to improve the detection of biosecurity risks? The Minister for Agriculture, Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Davey, and thank you for championing rural and regional New South Wales uh, in your time here. Australians are well known for our innovation and applying new technologies to develop solutions. The black box, flight recorder, electronic pacemaker, Google Maps, the cochlear implant, medical application of penicillin, to name just a few. The Liberal National Government is tapping into the fantastic Australian innovation culture and collaboration in many spaces to ensure we continue to manage the our ever increasing biosecurity risk. We have some of the highest biosecurity standards in the world, but the price of pest and disease free status is vigilance and a tough biosecurity regime, which is why we as a government have invested over $300 million in improving and updating our biosecurity over the coming years. Hitchhikers, these terrible pests and pathogens that find their way into vessels, bulk cargo, shipping containers, are a particular focus of our biosecurity attentions. Hitchhikers include pests like the red imported fire ant, giant African snails, Asian gypsy moths and the brown marmorated stink bugs. Read The New Yorker if you want a good read on that one. Our stringent standards are here to ensure that we keep these pests out. And we're always looking for more innovative ways to help people meet our standards. That's why we've been working with industry to seek uh, innovative solutions with small to medium businesses to develop pro uh, solutions to those problems through a grants program. Just this week, four companies were awarded grants under the in initiative to develop new technologies to detect these hitchhikers on or in our shipping containers, and we look forward to seeing this technology progress and benefit all our border protection and biosecurity efforts. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Can you explain what the risks are to farmers, their local communities and, more importantly, the wider Australian community of pest and disease incursions? Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Senator. The risks are very real. Just one uh, pest, the red imported fire ant, has the potential impact of $1.5 billion a year nationwide if they were to become established. We know that the state of Texas in the USA has already spending $1.2 billion a year to control the ant, repairing the damage it causes and covering medical costs. Our sugarcane farmers do not want to have these pests in their crops. But we also, similarly as community members, don't want them in our barbecues or in our kids' playgrounds. The risks are real and impact our farmers' ability to export their clean green produce and our communities. The number of consignments arriving via the air cargo pathway is growing, as are the risks. Volumes have increased uh, from 15 million consignments in 2011-12 to 50 million uh, just this last financial year. There are 2.5 million uh, consignments inbound on international arrivals by air. And oh, I thought you were going to call Senator me up. Sorry. Senator <laughs> Davey, a final supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you. How will the development of these new technologies benefit Australian agriculture and therefore all of Australia? Senator McKenzie. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. These will help us maintain protection from pests and diseases and boost our biosecurity status. We need a strong biosecurity status to build on our premium exports of food and fibre. Without exports, we can't grow agriculture, and without agriculture and food and fibre production and processing, we lose jobs, many of them in rural and regional Australia. There are over 1.6 million people employed in the food and fibre industry across Australia, and maintaining our biosecurity, pest and disease-free status is essential for those Australians uh, having sustainable and profitable career options out and around regional communities. Because tough biosecurity measures underpin our trade efforts, ensuring that we can confidently attract a premium price for our premium product. Uh, in the markets of the world. Senator Ayres. Uh, my question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. When did the Prime Minister first become aware that Minister Taylor had an association with Eastern Australian Irrigation, a company registered in the Cayman Islands? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, Mr President. I'll have to take that question on notice. Senator Ayres, a supplementary question. I refer to Minister Taylor's sta statements in the House of Representatives that he has disclosed interests in accordance with the rules. Has Minister Taylor disclosed to the Prime Minister any income or other benefit derived from consultancy fees to Eastern Australian agriculture or Eastern Australian infrastructure or any of their other associated entities? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, the Prime Minister has full confidence in uh, Minister Taylor and the fact that he has declared all of his interests consistent with uh, the rules. And I will Order. take on notice uh, the uh, other parts of the questions. Senator Ayres, a final supplementary question. We'll try and get somewhere with this line of questioning. Is the Prime Minister aware of whether Minister Taylor or any of his associated entities? or indirect interests receive any payments, income or benefit from the $80 million water buyback from Eastern Australia Agriculture? Senator Cormann. Thank you very much, Mr President. Uh, I will take that question on notice. I don't accept the premise of the question because I'm obviously not necessarily going to accept uh, everything just as fact because the Labor Party puts it here into the public domain this way. But in the context of the question that's been asked, uh, I will see what I can appropriately provide on notice. Uh, and I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Senators, could I take this opportunity to make a couple of statements to the House about matters relating to the Senate? Firstly. The past system in Parliament House, like other security and information systems, is managed by the Department of Parliamentary Services under the authority of both presiding officers on behalf of the Parliament, under conventional notions of the control of, the par of parliamentary precincts and under the Parliamentary Precincts Act 1988. The powers of the presiding officers to manage and control the precincts apply subject to the resolutions of either House. This means that the administration of these security and information systems is constrained by the powers, privileges and immunities of the Houses and their members. In any question of parliamentary administration, proper regard needs to be given to these matters. In this regard, I endorse and restate advice given to the Senate Committee of Privileges by the former clerk of the Senate that says, and I quote, Proper consideration of the powers, privileges and immunities of the Houses and their members is a primary consideration for any officer or employee of the parliamentary service. An understanding of the powers, privileges and immunities of the Houses and their members should underpin any policy that is formulated or any administrative action that is taken by a parliamentary department or its staff. When the new CCTV Code of Practice was enacted in August last year, it was explicitly updated to recognise that the administration of that system was subject to the privileges of the Houses and their members. In particular, the Code was updated to constrain access to stored images so that, where it appeared that a request for access to images might raise questions of privilege, the request required the approval of the presiding officers. This constraint was intended to alleviate the risk that the system might be used in a manner which might interfere with the ability of senators and members to freely undertake their duties in this building. The code was also amended to require that officers involved in the administration of the system undertake relevant training in privilege matters, which is now routinely provided by the two House departments. 
The consultation I undertook prior to it being enacted also reflected the specific concerns raised by senators and reports of the Committee of Privileges regarding the protection of parliamentary privilege. Ensuring this protection in managing these systems is my highest priority. Senators have indicated a desire to see that similar protections apply to the use of the new swipe card electronic access control system. Although I believe there is a minimal risk that the operation of the system will raise questions of privilege, it is nevertheless my view that the policy under which the system operates must contain the same constraints upon its use. The new swipe card system has been activated in part of Parliament House, but currently only in a trial phase in the Senate, including my own office. In my view, this operation requires an interim approval of policy to manage it, the information it collects and ensure issues of privilege are respected and protected. In enacting this interim phase, no data from the system will be released without the approval of the presiding officers. This is a stricter standard than is in place under the revised CCTV policy. If I approve any such release relating to the Senate or a senator, I commit to reporting it to the Appropriations Staffing and Security Committee and also informing the Committee of Privileges. As with all such matters, I will consider any such question of privilege in consultation with the sen any senator affected and with the advice of the clerk. To ensure the final iteration of the policy reflects the protections required, I will seek the approval for a small working group of senators to work jointly with members of the other place to finalise the operative provisions and rules of the policy and ensure that privilege, that privilege issues are comprehensively considered and that there is general acceptance of its features. I thank the Senate. Senator O'Neill. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I seek leave to move a motion to take note of your statement. Leave granted. Leave is granted. Thank you. I move that the Senate take note of the President's statement. Mr President, as Chair of the Senate Privileges Committee, I welcome your statement and thank you for providing the committee with a briefing on this matter at a meeting this morning. Since its inquiry into an incident involving the improper use of Parliament's CCTV system in 2014, the committee has taken a close interest in the administration of security systems in Parliament House and the policies that underpin that administration. In its 160th report on that matter, the committee concluded that the problems with the administration of the code, which became subject of the committee's inquiry, arose principally through interpretations of the code which gave insufficient weight to the ordinary meaning of its language interpretations which gave insufficient consideration to the code's security focus and the context in which it was introduced and operates, a disregard for the powers, privileges and immunities of the parliament which necessarily constrained administrative action under the code, and a failure to recognise that decisions about the application of privilege are matters for the parliament, not for parliamentary administration. In that report on the CCTV matter, the committee called for the CCTV Code of Practice to be revised in a manner which restores the focus on matters of security and safety and emphasises accountability to presiding officers and the parliament, with appropriate regard for the primacy of the powers, privileges and immunities of the houses and their members. Further, after a number of helpful discussions with your predecessor and yourself, the committee formed the more general view that policies for the administration of security and information systems in Parliament House should specify that the administration of the system and the powers given to officers under such policies are subject to the powers, privileges and immunities of the House and their members, and indicate that the Houses may treat any improper interference with a House, a parliamentary committee or a member or a senator as a contempt. The committee noted at paragraph 3.5 in its 160th report, and I quote, the accountability required in an instrument like the CCTV Code of Practice is not a bureaucratic or technical requirement. The purpose of those accountability requirements is to ensure that decisions are made by the right people and that they are made in an informed way. The CCTV system is managed by DPS and under the authority of the presiding officers, but its operation is necessarily constrained by the powers and immunities of the House and their members. When a conflict arises or appears to arise between the exercise of an administrative function and any aspect of those powers and immunities, the committee considers that determination of that conflict must begin with accountability to the source of the power being exercised. 
I appreciate, Mr. President, that you have undertaken to apply these principles in the implementation of an interim policy for the EACS system and in developing a final policy in conjunction with a working group of senators and members. On behalf of the Privileges Committee, I also note and appreciate your willingness to provide reports on requests to da access data retained by the EAC system to both the Appropriations, uh, Staffing and Security Committee and Privileges Committee at the same time you approve such access. This will ensure that senators are informed of the uses and requests for the data maintained by the system. From the perspective of the opposition, I do flag we have identified a number of concerns about the way in which the new swipe card system was initiated and rolled out, and the opposition will be making further comment about those matters when the Senate returns in September. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Sen Senate. Senator Betts. Um, for completeness, can I indicate as Deputy Chair that in general terms uh, I fully support that which the uh, Chair has just indicated to the Senate. Um, would Senator Urquhart. Um, I seek leave to continue the remarks. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Senators. Can I make one brief other announcement? Today is the last day uh, that the Clerk of the House of Representatives will sit in Parliament. David Elder joined the House of Representatives staff in 1981. Um, he has served the House of Representatives in various capacities now for 38 years, and he was, after serving in senior roles such as Sergeant at Arms, was appointed clerk in 2013. His official retirement is next week, uh, but given the extraordinary service of Mr Elder, uh, given that I think we all in both chambers rely upon and immensely respect the service of all the officers, but particularly the senior officers upon whom we rely for such advice, it was worth noting that uh, he has given extensive, long-standing and excellent service to the House of Representatives and through that to the broader parliament and to the community of Australia. And I note that in the other place there are going to be more detailed mentions of his service. Senator Reynolds. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Yesterday at question time, I took on uh, notice a question from Senator Chis Chisholm, and uh, I'd just like to respond now to that question. Uh, in, in answer to the question, the government is responding to the genuine need of employers who cannot find enough Australian local workers to meet their labour needs. Australia is firmly committed to growth of the seasonal worker program and the new Pacific Labour Scheme which deliver outcomes for Pacific Island countries and also for Australian businesses. The Pacific Labor Scheme commenced on 1 July 2018, and since that date, 217 Pacific workers have taken up work opportunities in Australia through the scheme. We're confident that the Pacific Labor Scheme will grow substantially. Our experience from the seasonal worker program indicates strong growth, but over time. In 2018-19, uh, there was a 44 per cent growth compared to the previous year, and that is in 2017-18, there were 8,459 workers granted visas, and in 2018-19, it grew to 12,200. Australian businesses do use a mix of visa programs to meet their increasing labour needs. Pacific labour mobility programs are a government priority. And matters relating uh, to the issue that he raised on working holiday maker visa program should be referred to the Home Affairs portfolio. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. Thank you, Minister. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senators Rustin and Cormann to the questions asked by Senators Green, Keneally and O'Neill. Thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, Madam President, unfortunately, uh, we are already seeing a continuation under the government in this term of the steady trend towards the far right that we saw from this government in the last term. So we may be in a new term of parliament, the third term for this Abbott, Morrison, uh, Turnbull government, but it's the same old Liberals and Nationals, the same old dog whistling the same old pandering to the far right of politics. Who can forget in the last term the debacle where we saw the Liberals and Nationals vote for uh, a, an extreme right-wing motion put forward, I think it was by Senator Hanson, that it's okay to be white. And we were told at the time uh, that that was actually due to some sort of administrative error. Well, the actions that have been revealed over question time this week 
uh, of the same nature cannot be blamed on an administrator of error, because we are now seeing uh, the open endorsement of extreme right-wing hate speech by figures within this government. At the last election, before the last election, we saw many moderate members of the Liberal Party flee the parliament, and it's increasingly clear that we're now left with what is an increasingly conservative rump. They are the true leaders of the Liberal Party in this place. Now, the government says that hate speech is the price of free speech. I utterly reject that, and Labor utterly rejects that. Hate speech is not free speech. Hate speech is different. Hate speech incites hatred and violence, and it is grounded in someone's personal characteristics. It's about attacking someone because of their race, their religion, their sexuality, their gender. That is not normal, the normal cut and thrust of debate. That is something quite different and something that all of us should stand against. What has given rise to this is the revelation that at least two members of this government uh, intend and have been advertised as participating in and appearing on stage at the Conservative Political Action Conference. That's a conference that's going to be attended by high-profile right-wing extremists, including US Congressman Matt Gates, best known for inviting Holocaust denier Charles C. Johnson to the State of the Union, a man who asked for help taking out a Black Lives Matter activist and denying that over six million Jewish people were murdered in the Holocaust. In addition, uh, that conference will be addressed by failed UKIP leadership candidate Rahim Kassam, whose actions include uh, labelling the Quran as fundamentally evil and uh, insulting in the most offensive way possible uh, British politician Nicola Sturgeon. Uh, also in attendance will be some known to us in this chamber uh, and in this parliament, including former Prime Minister Tony Abbott and, of course, Queensland LNP Senator Amanda Stoker and Liberal MP Craig Kelly. Now, those you associate with does say something about you. And Senator Stoker has made an active choice here to share a stage with right-wing extremists such as the two that I've just mentioned. She's not required to attend this conference by virtue of her membership of a political party or anything of the sort. She has made an active choice to share a stage with these right-wing extremists. Now, the government's lack of concern about this conference and, in fact, its participation in this conference is appalling. How can government members promote the kind of hate speech that is being sprouted by those attending? I was encouraged yesterday when Senator Cormann described the various statements made by speakers at this conference as abhorrent, disgraceful and completely outrageous. But unfortunately, overnight, we've seen Senator Stoker double down, uh, saying that the CPAC program is packed with incredible speakers who've got some great ideas to share. And she has also suggested that the idea of banning uh, the attendance of Mr Kassam would be stupid, impractical and harmful for a civil society. And now today we've seen Senator Cormann backtrack from his earlier remarks. He's changed his position on this conference and he's released a statement that informs us that the attendance of current and former members and senators at CPAC is a matter for those individuals. Their attendance at this conference does not imply agreement or endorsement with the views of any of the other speakers attending in any way. So, unfortunately, Senator Cormann has gone from thinking this was abhorrent to now approving of participation. So, clearly, overnight, we've seen the hard right of the Liberal Party lay down its instructions and get him to change position. We must take a stand on right-wing extremism, you, Senator not Your support time it. Has expired. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, what a great opportunity this is to deal with some of the rubbish we have had served up in the last two question times. Yeah, yeah. And I'm going to start by taking some of the points that have been served up in the, the warm slop that has just been provided by Senator Watt. First, he has twice, not once but twice, taken um, the statement I made yesterday, quoted it out of context, twisted it, cut and pasted it somewhere else. So I'm going to help him out. I'm going to provide the words I supplied in context, because in context they make a whole lot more sense than the nonsense that's been spurted from those people on the other side. So let's get in there. It goes a bit like this. If we're doing our job properly as politicians, we will talk to people from all walks of life every day. 
and we won't agree with them all. Trying to shame into silence anyone who would speak to a person who is wrong on an issue damages our capacity to have a constructive democracy. When we're confronted with people with whom we disagree, the answer isn't to pretend that you know, you're too good to walk into a room with them. The answer isn't to, to carry on and virtue signal and make out you are nice as pie, so good you wouldn't even walk near these people. Instead, the answer is to engage with people who have wrong-headed ideas. The answer is to, the answer is to talk to Order. them about why their view is wrong and why it should shift. To do anything less than this means inhabiting an echo chamber of people Order. who all think exactly the same way. And you know what? That explains a lot about the Labor Party. They only talk to themselves. And that's why they think that you can't even walk into a room Order. unless you have checked out the backgrounds of every single person who's in the room to see whether or not they have the same preconceived ideas that you do. You know what? Let's get to the direct quote they've taken out of context. Their ideas, Order. their deplatforming nonsense means that you couldn't walk into a room without doing background checks on everyone in it. That's stupid, impractical and harmful for a civil society. That's what I said. I didn't say it was stupid and impractical to condemn bad beliefs. I think the views of Mr Kassam are stupid and childish and wrong. But there's a very, very big difference between a person who is an ex-Muslim man, who is now an atheist, part of the same ethnic minority, who has now made a decision that he opposes radical Islam, and when he talks about it, he's talking about his own experiences. A man from the very same ethnic minority criticising the group with which he was raised. The views of Labor here are, in fact, actually <laughs> rather bigoted. Because why should some faiths, some ideas, be immune from the ordinary battle of ideas, the ability to take on each other, think about what they've got to say, and let the good ideas rise to the top? This should not be a strange thing. And you know what? Order. They're going to make out they're perfect and pure, that they never hang out with people who do anything wrong. We all know the people that Senator Keneally hangs out with have a fabulous record on corruption. And we know that um, Senator Wong likes to hang out with a bloke by the name of Benjamin Law, who quite happily talks about how he would like to hate F-U-C-K. Um, my parliamentary colleague, Mr Hastie. Senator Stoker, please resume your seat. It is not appropriate to use that language in any form at all, whether directly or indirectly. I'll ask you to withdraw. I'll withdraw it, though I'm not quite sure how Senator I'm Senator Stoker, please resume your seat. I have asked you directly. This is a ruling of the president. So I have asked you directly to withdraw. I don't want any ifs and buts. Please withdraw. I'll happily withdraw it. Thank you. Though I Please. confess, I don't know how I'm supposed Senator to. Senator Stoker, I would urge you, instead of arguing with me when I've ruled, to read the president's order. I would ask you to simply withdraw and continue without any other remarks. Of course, I withdraw. Thank but you. when there are views like that coming from Senator Wong and the people and the company she keeps, she is in no position to preach about the way that people treat one another. When people would be suggesting that that kind of conduct is an appropriate way to treat other people in this parliament based on their beliefs genuinely held, I am not going to be preached to from people on this side who make out they are holier than thou. They are so muddle-headed, so weak in their thinking, so willing to think that anyone who walks into the same room by definition has the same beliefs. Wow. Any sensible person can see that that just defies logic. It makes absolutely no sense. If we are doing our job properly as politicians, we talk to all people and we convey ideas that are right. We don't grandstand, we don't virtue signal, but we do respect free speech. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Your time has expired. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much. And I think um, the speech that we just heard is a perfect example of grandstanding. And, um, 
And I, I raise serious concerns about the fact that a senator from this place thinks it's appropriate to share a platform, to share a platform with a man who's made the most outrageous comments, were, which were in the, qu the question that I uh, put to Senator Rustin. I want to declare at the beginning that I absolutely believe in freedom of speech. I also believe in freedom of people to manifest their religion, freedom of movement, freedom of association, freedom to form unions and fight for the rights of hard-working Australians. But I don't believe in freedom to spew hate. That is something I don't believe in. Senator Stoker would have us believe that this is about having a conversation. We're way past the point of a conversation about a discussion about ideas when you're standing in a public place, at a platform in the public community, with a man who is on the record and does not deny that he tweeted into the public space a comment about the Scottish National Party leader Nicola Sturgeon, who had recently suffered a miscarriage. And he tweeted, and he thought this was OK. Can someone just like tape Nicola Sturgeon's mouth shut and her legs so she can't reproduce? This man is a public figure. With, map, with remarks of that kind on the public record. If Senator Stoker really believed that this was a conversation worthy of having, she could send him a letter. She could get him on the phone. She could have a conversation with him in private if she felt so obliged. But instead, she has chosen in her role as a senator to stand on a platform with this man. Now, yesterday we had a view that was offered to us by Senator Cormann. Yesterday this was his view. These were the words. Disgraceful was how he condemned that language from Mr Rahim, um, Rahim Kassam. Disgraceful and highly objectionable, he said yesterday. Completely outrageous, he said yesterday. I entirely abhor it said Senator Cormann yesterday. I'm sure anyone in this Senate abhors it, he said yesterday. But today he had a different tune. He had a different tune. And he's indicated, as was reflected in the great contribution from my colleague Senator Watt, that he's stepping back from that natural abhorrence at what can only be described as hate speech. This government has the capacity to prevent the harm that comes from having voices like Rahim Kassar's broadcast further into our community. I can tell you as an Australian what I don't like as a member of the Labor Party, as a senator in this great parliament. I don't like people who vilify those I live in community with. I don't want to give a platform to voices of hate. I'm up for every decent discussion of ideas. But hate speech is a lot more than just a bad idea, and this man is a propagator of hate speech at a forum that will be filled with people who can't wait to hear the kind of hate that he wants to spread. That is not good for our democracy. There is a difference here. It needs to be understood, and the line needs to be drawn. But just as Senator Cormann, in his statement overnight, walked away from that judgment, that fair and rational and reasonable judgment of Mr Rahim Kassab's statements yesterday, we have a government that is failing to use some of the legislation that they so often crow about. Section 501 of the Migration Act exists so that a minister has the power to refuse the visa of an individual of such a character. The minister can refuse the visa. If there is a significant risk that an individual would vilify a segment of Australian community or incite discord or represent danger to them during their time in Australia, this government can act. At the very least, they should counsel Senator Stoker, give her the opportunity to have the conversation that she keeps talking about. But standing on a platform, giving a speech, giving a sense of the significance of her role here as a senator to such a man Thank is you, a failure Senator of democracy. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. 
Thank you, Deputy President. Well, for somebody who is so outraged, so outraged about giving a platform to this man, a man who, thanks very much to Labor's uh, determination to give him a platform, I had to Google. I also appre appreciate enormously that Senator O'Neill has taken the trouble to repeat his comments at least three times this afternoon. So if this person did not have a platform before, Labor has done their job, his job for him. It is extraordinary. And I think that the Senate has now descended into the same sort of language that you declared to abhor. I think it is uh, frankly bizarre. But this afternoon, once again, the opposition has raised the same issues that we have heard them go on about this week, that the ministers, the relevant ministers, have answered. And I understand that members of the opposition might be confused and that they do really believe that these are the issues that are so burningly important to the mums and dads across Australia and even union members across Australia. It would be terrific if they took the same level of interest in the issues facing real people and, importantly, farmers right across Australia. But we know that Labor is not interested in real issues for real people. We know that because in my home state of Queensland, not only has the Labor government given uh, unpractical regulations and removed the ability for landholders to manage their land, on June of 18 this year, the Queensland Labor government's trigger maps were labelled a joke after the maps showed Suncorp Stadium in the middle of Brisbane. And I'm sure the New South Wales members here would be very familiar with Suncorp Stadium. It's the middle of Brisbane as a high-risk area where endangered or vulnerable plants were present or likely to be present. It seems extraordinary that the turfed area of the cauldron, that highly sacred place for Queenslanders, would have turned up as a high-risk vegetation management area. But we know that Labor is not interested in real issues for real people and particularly for real farmers. In fact, they are doing their very best by banding together with the Greens to ensure that there are no farmers and no food grown in Australia at all. They have no understanding or interest in the issues that are important to regional Australia, to the sort of professionalism and innovation that's happening out in the real world where people have real issues and a real agenda. But unfortunately, Labor has no agenda and insp instead has spent this week and this question time again giving a platform to, and I'm going to have to look the person up again because this person had no profile, had no uh, recognition at all in Australia until Senator O'Neill has managed to put his comments into Hansard three times this afternoon. Order. So who can forget Order. the debacle of the recent federal election where the Labor Party took policies to the Australian people that Australian people told in no uncertain terms were not relevant, were not useful to them? Australia is a wonderful country, but if you listen to Labor, you would think we were quite broken. But I can tell you that we are not a broken country at all. So I, I can only congratulate the members of the Labor Party who have taken what they deem hate speech and given it a very high profile. It is unfortunate. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Senator Green. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I, take, I rise to take note of the question I asked Senator Rustin um, uh, today, uh, a question that Sen Senator Macdonald has just referred to as not a real issue. Not a real issue that people in Townsville are receiving debt notices despite not having yet recovered from the unprecedented flooding that took place in February. And this is an important issue, and I, I want to do it justice by going through the chronology and, and making it clear that this is something that needs to be dealt with. 
and not minced around with. On 17 July, The Guardian reported that Centrelink had recommenced robo-debt in, in Townsville, despite a quarantine being in place on 17 July. On 18 July, I met with the Townsville Legal Centre and confirmed with them that robo-debt had recommenced in Townsville. It's that easy. There was an article. I went to Townsville. I asked if it was happening. I found out it was happening. So on the 23rd of July, I asked the minister in the Senate why robo-debt had recommenced in Townsville. And she said there has been no debt recovery commenced in Townsville. That was her answer. On the same day, though, her department, Department of Human Services, told the Townsville Bulletin the compliance activity had resumed. I just want to, I want to make that clear. The department said on the 23rd of July that compliance activity had resumed. So the next day after that, the day after that, I came in again and I asked the minister, I gave her a chance to explain why, according to reports and first-hand discussions with the Townsville Legal Centre, why people were getting debt letters in Townsville. And again, she assured the Senate that debt recovery had not resumed. Yesterday, I tabled a debt notice from a recipient in, would you believe it, in Townsville, who had received a debt letter from Centrelink on the 8th of July. And when we brought that letter to the minister's attention, didn't things start to get a little bit shakier? So again today, I asked the minister, why a person in Townsville, affected by the floods, had received a debt notice letter, a demand to pay money now? And again, instead of giving a straight answer, we got weasel words and splitting hairs. And frankly, it is hard to believe some of these answers that are coming up because the department says one thing and the minister says another. So either two things are happening here. Either there's gross incompetence happening or there's just complete disregard for the people of Townsville. And when faced with this uncomfortable truth, what does the government do? True to form, they deny and they play the person. The minister tried to say that she was extremely disappointed in me. Well, Minister Rustin and Minister Robert in the other place have unsuccessfully tried to split hairs over what constitutes debt collection. The minister wants people in Townsville to accept that a letter telling a recipient that they owe over $2,000 does not constitute debt recovery. I don't know, if I get a letter telling me, demanding that I pay a debt in four weeks, that sounds like debt recovery to me. Nobody is suggesting that a legitimate debt should not be paid back. But we've got to let this community get back on its feet before sending around debt collectors particularly when we know that these so-called debt, robo-debts are often incorrectly calculated in the first place. Another very important question that is yet to be answered, when we have a look at this chronology, is where in all of this is the new member for Herbert? Where is he? He's gone missing. This was one of the first tests of his leadership, and he has gone missing when the most vulnerable members of his community need him most. Townsville residents are hurting and they should not be harassed by the government for debts that they may not even owe. The pursuit of vulnerable, traumatised people receiving Centrelink benefits is, at best, ill-conceived and, at worst, callous. The minister said yesterday that she was extremely disappointed in me. Well, can I say this? I am extremely disappointed in the minister and I am extremely disappointed in the member for Herbert on behalf of the people of Townsville. Thank you, Senator Green. So the question is that the motion is put by Senator Watt to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against the ayes have it. Senator McKim. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. I move to take note of the response to questions asked by Senator De Natale to the Minister uh, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Uh, Senator De Natale quite rightly raised the issue of the 5th Pacific Islands Development Forum Leaders Summit this week and referenced the fact that uh, our Pacific neighbours have joined now over 900 jurisdictions worldwide to declare a climate emergency. 
and that they have asked uh, relevant parties to the Kyoto Protocol to refrain from using carryover credits as abatements for emission reduction targets, which, of course, as Senator Di Natale made clear in his question, was squarely aimed at Australia, as there is no other country, no other country, that intends to rely uh, on these credits in order to keep polluting our atmosphere. Now, what we got from the government was, uh, quite frankly, a pathetic response to Senator Di Natale's question. The government's confirmed today that it does intend to rely on an accounting trick to try and con the world and con Pacific Island nations in particular that it's taking the requisite strong action on the breakdown of our global climate. Now, let me assure the government that the Earth's atmosphere and our climate cares not one whit for accounting tricks. What it cares about is the total amount of carbon equivalent gases that we emit into it. We are in a climate emergency. Our climate is breaking down around us. Our house is on fire. And when we are in a war situation, we are quite quick to establish war cabinets, to try and take the politics out of our response to those crises. Well, where's our war cabinet today when we are facing an existential threat to, at the very least, the survival of our civilisation <laughs> and potentially the survival of humans and a species? I mean, seriously, even birds know not to foul their own nests. But here we are, fouling our own nest. And I can say to government members, and also the Labor Party, who still uh, is in love with the coal industry, as we've seen by the establishment of uh, a group this week, the Parliamentary Friends of Coal Exports, with uh, members from both major parties involved in the establishment of that group, I say to the major parties, if you can't feel the social contract fracturing, if you can't feel the foundations, the very foundations of law and order and the rule of law and trust in our most precious institutions crumbling, you are simply not paying attention to what is going on. And those foundations are crumbling for many reasons. The trust deficit is spiking for many reasons. But primary among them is our collective failure as policymakers and lawmakers to take strong enough action in response to the breakdown of our climate and the extinction crisis that we are facing. I'll say something to young people. I'm so very, very sorry for our failings. My generation is collectively stealing your future by refusing to take anything like the strong, concerted action that we need to address the climate emergency. And of course, one of the real tragedies of that situation is that the people in here making these decisions, or in fact not making, the requisite decisions will not be around to face the full consequences of our failures, or if we are around, we'll be wealthy enough to escape the worst of those consequences. It's poor people, it's our children and our grandchildren, it's Pacific Island nations who will disappear forever under sea level rise that will pay the price for our criminal negligence. Thank you, Senator Kim. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Kim to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it.